Now, when you visit the theatre, do you expect to be warned before a scary ghost appears or a bit of smoke is puffed onto the stage? I expect the answer is absolutely not, because that's the point of going to the theatre, isn't it? To be surprised. Content warnings are becoming as much of a theatrical staple as grabbing yourself a vanilla ice cream tub and wooden spoon in the interval. Uh, here to argue why content warnings are not only patronising, but are an attack on theatre's reason to exist, is the Telegraph's theatre critic, Dominic Cavendish. Dominic. Good thanks. to be here. Good to be here. Thanks for, thanks for coming. I mean, uh, putting, putting sort of content warnings on, on plays, it's in the same vein as putting a warning on novels at universities. Does it not completely ruin the ending, or at least a vital part of what the, the novel or play is about? Well, it's a kind of... It's a tricky question because it's one of these things I thought the other week as I was sitting down to pen the article which said, you know, hang on a minute, what's going on? You know, there's going to be people who immediately snap back at you and say, what, where's the harm in, in adding a little bit of extra information on a website, maybe as you go into a theatre foyer that just lays the groundwork for some people who might feel a bit, you know, intrepid and upset and easily scared about things. And I, I felt that actually it's time to say, hang on a minute, because there is a, there is a sort of principle at stake. As you said in your introduction, there is a fundamental need, I think, when we go to the theatre, to put our trust, our faith in what's happening on stage. We don't quite know what's going to happen. We can't quite articulate in advance or indeed want other people to tell us exactly what happens and how we're going to respond. So I think there's a really fine line at the moment between theatres sort of rightly wanting to protect perhaps the most vulnerable members of their potential audience and I suppose the great bulk of theatre goers who want to make sure that they're not going into a space that hasn't, you know, some have been sort of sanitised mm. and turned into a sort of ideological safe space where already before they've even advanced into a sort of, I don't know, a line of Shakespeare or the curtain has risen, they sort of know what's, what's in store. And yeah. I think that's, yeah, there's a kind of fundamental element of jeopardy with, with the theatre. We leave the you know, comfort zone of our house of an evening. We don't sit at home. We go out into a slightly unfamiliar area. Mm. And with other people, that's the ancient compact. With other people, we are exposed to surprises, to the full gamut of human emotions, you know, laughter, tears, rage. And I think as we start sort of compartmentalising these difficult themes and flagging them up, um, we, are, you know, we may be on a slippery slope to s slightly sort of cut down the in intrinsic value of theatre, which is, as you know, I think most people would say, is to be taken out of yourself and to be forced to confront yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and do you think this is a, a, a sort of um, symptom of the safetyism that's creeping into other areas of life? And we see it with health and safety, where obviously, you know, we want people to wear hard hats and to know, you know, if, there, if there's going to be a, a, sudden, a sudden step or something like that. But when this, uh, you know, creeps into, um, you know, works of art and entertainment, um, all of a sudden people are being warned about, you know, something that could shock them. And I understand if it's something like strobe lighting that could induce an epileptic fit but when it's just something that uh, that is going to make people feel scared or feel i mean that's the whole point of going to the theater and we're changing the external world to control our own feelings rather than trying to moderate our own feelings ourselves having control of our feelings ourselves yeah i mean i think that's a really good point i mean the the issue is, of course, you know, and, and this has been, you know, in a way it's been in, in the air for ages, is, you know, there's going to be a loud bang, there's going to be strobe lighting. Some people have medical conditions and they don't want to be having a really terrible time. But equally, at the other end of the spectrum is, are all these incredibly subjective terms. Mm. And you get, you get, you know, you, at, the, at the moment you're getting things like, and, you know, the Bristol Vic is a, is a very good example, Hamlet, a, a staple of the repertoire. Yeah. Play that I think a lot of people are familiar with, you know, they're itemising that it contains discussions of, you know, death and and suicide and this sort of thing and you start see oh and blood of course and you start seeing a sort of strange conflation of of the sort of the strobe anxieties the medical conditions and this kind of pseudo medical language where bit by bit they're sort of pushing down the corridors and going oh there's a reference to death or there's a reference to something else and so i think that's the point at which you start going this is uh, sort of weird sort of nanny statism, and maybe it has arisen partly, I mean, it's only in the last few years, really, we've started seeing it spring up. Maybe it's being accelerated by the pandemic and the fact that theatres took charge of their audiences a lot right. during that period, and they were telling them to wear masks and present their vaccine status, and bit by bit, they've become this rather sort of cosseting force. Mm. Um, but equally, of course, there's an entire kind of ideological thrust that's happening in theatre at the moment, which I think is trying to 
argue what is and isn't permissible. And I think if, if as, as I saw the other day on Twitter, somebody was gently raising an eyebrow at the uh, content warnings on Tammy Faye, which is the new Elton John musical at the Almedia, and there was a huge sort of Twitter outburst at this hapless um, punter who said, uh, you know, this is a bit ridiculous. Um, and what were the content Well, I mean, this is, this is quite a development in some ways because the Almeida is very much the home of the cutting-edge experimental art, mm. and they are sort of religious in a way about not letting critics in a night early. So there's always an element of surprise. You always go and you go, oh, how is Andrew Scott going to play Hamlet? Oh, well, you've got 20 minutes to write the review. They don't want you at your leisure, picking it all through. It's a very sort of exciting, event-driven kind of space. But mm. now, seemingly, they've gone down the route of putting a sign up saying there's going to be references to HIV, AIDS, uh, cancer again, sickness. Um, and I think it's quite weirdly glib, almost comic. I don't want to say that, but I mean, there's an element to which you go, these are huge themes. Yeah. These, are, these are the stuff of mass trauma. Mm. And so, so to walk into a theatre space and see like a sort of, you know, fasten your seatbelt sign, you sort of go, this isn't... This, how does that relate to the extraordinary infinite permutations that I may experience in that, in that show? Yeah. And so I think in some ways they're short-selling the event before it's even happened. Yeah. And, they're clo and maybe they're sort of dr driving the discussion in a way that I think will result possibly... I don't want to be alarmist about it, but I think possibly in the sense that they will come hostage to fortune. People will start looking through these lists and go, oh, mm, yeah, not only do I not want this, but I think it's, we've moved beyond the point where this is allowable. So, right. you know, is there going to be misgendering? Is there going to be some kind of transphobic content? You look at a lot of the repertoire in the post-war canon, and some, some of it, if, if you wanted to, you could flag it up as being somehow, you know, a little bit impermissible now. I mean, mm. Harold Pinter's plays, his breakthrough play, The Caretaker, you know, contains racist language in the first sort of four, four minutes or so. And you think, well, will, will theatre start saying, hmm, rather than go to the, the worry line of telling punters that this thing is in there, maybe we'll just remove it. Mm. Maybe we'll just slightly sort of chip away at the problematic stuff so there isn't this massive list. Right. Have less stage blood, have fewer deaths. Maybe, as in the case of um, Seagull in the West End this summer, uh, there's, there is, uh, you know, again, somebody uh, attempting to take their life in that rather famous play by Chekhov, and they didn't use uh, gunshot, they used a sudden a sort of flash of light. Right. And this seemed quite avant-garde and, prog and progressive, but equally I was starting to think, well, is this because you now, you, you don't want the worry of upsetting someone, you don't yeah. want the, the fear of, of, of triggering a trauma. But we're all triggerable. I mean, we're all, I don't know whether about you, but most of us go to the theatre, and I think half the time, you know, even on a good night, I'm, I'm nearly in buckets of tears because you go, it, it's a release mechanism. All the stuff that you've been sitting on all day or, or, or year or life yeah. will, be, will be found. That's the point of it. It's supposed to be the most intense experience, yeah. the most extreme experience. Although, I mean, if you think plays are good, wait until you see films. Oh, my God. There's, like, car chases, there's robots. But um, getting back to... The, yeah, I did, I've heard about that. There's good stuff there, apparently. <laughs> do you think, uh, think theatre could actually use this to its benefit and it could become a selling point for, for plays? Because I, I know when, in the 90s, when I was buying, when I was a teenager buying rap albums, I'd always look for the parental advisory sticker because then I knew it was going to be, it was going to be something, you know, worth yeah. listening to. Yeah, I, well, I, I think in a, in a strange way, we seem to come into a new sort of youth culture, perhaps, of people being very exercised about stuff. Mm. So there's a sort of strange annoy the parents thing. You know, I'm in that, in that role now of going, why, you know, we grew up with nothing. We had no... I walked into Titus Andronicus as a 17-year-old and there's dismemberment, there's, there's, there's cannibalism, there's all kinds of horrors in that. Mm. I, think I didn't know theatre could be like this. Yeah. And maybe it's just a kind of kickback from the 20-somethings going, OK, we're going to really stress you out by telling you that we're upset about this. But actually, of course, it's just a way of demarcating the territory and going, we own this space now. Yeah. You know, get lost, Grandad. And I think, I think partly... The, the tussle of it is maybe an interest. It's a pr provocation. But I do, I do think, you know, with, in the light of the Terry Gilliam cancellation of his, uh, his musical um, Into the Woods at the Old Vic, yeah. there is this strange atmosphere at the moment where I think the theatre world is slightly, you know, it's doing its best, it's very well-intentioned, but it's trying to go down this path of, of, of worrying about everyone and worrying about potential reactions, yeah. worrying about things going viral. And you go, actually, you've got to relax a bit more. You've got to allow people to maybe flip out. I wouldn't mind... I mean, I know they have relaxed performances now, and uh, they call them chilled performances, where you can kind of come and go as you want. But maybe that's the shift that needs to happen, rather than these little 
drab lists is go, you know what, we haven't heard enough people crying in the theatre recently. If you want to howl, howl, it doesn't matter. But I think this strangely academic, arid um, parceling it all down seems, uh, just as I said before, well, antithetical to yeah. the spirit of the thing. And too much power seems to be given to, to venue staff. I mean, I'm seeing, uh, I mean, I've, I've had a tour show, touring show, stand-up comedy, which is sort of like theatre. Bit more fun, but like um, you're seeing <laughs> venue staff uh, making the the decisions and curating what's on stage. So some you know blue haired 22 year old usher who's on minimum wage is suddenly deciding what people, what members of the public can be exposed to. Are we seeing this? Because I think with Terry Gilliam's uh, play, it was cancelled because uh, staff. Complete. Yeah, well, this is sort of shrouded in secrecy, really. Even when I interviewed him, he was saying, I can't tell you everything, I want to tell you everything I can't. And I think that sense of there being these sort of strange protocols of concern, and as I said, this kind of slightly pseudo-scientific idea of harm, yeah. and the idea increasingly that words are violence, and that ideas are kind of harmful and upsetting. Mm. And, and, and so I think... He's obviously at the, completely the wrong end of the spectrum as far as that goes. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, if you go back to the Jerry Sadovitz incident in Edinburgh at the festival this year, allegedly that was members of the staff at the Pleasance going, we don't really feel comfortable working in the environment where this man is telling these kinds of jokes. And we critics didn't actually get, most of us didn't get to see what the, tr the trouble was. Yeah. But I think, in a way, his... Um, catch-all is to say, you know, his show's called Not For Anybody. Yeah. Maybe that's the solution, is to just go, none of you are welcome, this yeah. will offend everyone, yeah. um, enter at your own peril. And yeah. I think that's, I mean, I, mean I, I do think maybe there's some practical solution. You could get a, a sort of Arts Council-sponsored website where every single little comma and expiration, you know, everything in that play is laid out, so you can just crush all the excitement <laughs> in advance. But for most of us, I think we want to go, hang on a minute, you know, I do, once it's out there, it's sort of out there, in the corner of your eye, and I think there's a great beauty. I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of really good instances where you go, God, if you were to, if you were to tell people what was in this play because of the theme of that, of that moment, yeah. you would kill that play. Yeah. And a really good example, I just, there are many, but is the brilliant play by uh, Conor McPherson, The Weir. And there's, a, there's a, just a heartbreaking scene in the middle of that. And it all relates to something that some people will find very distressing for reasons of their own life experience. But I sort of feel like, yeah, OK, maybe tell people about that. But once you've told them, they'll be waiting for it. And as soon as, they, and as, soon as it starts, they'll be, ahead of the, they'll be ahead of the drama. And I think the author has a bit of right, in a way, to go, hang on, this is my world, I've created this. You come in, you know, I'm not going to destroy you, I'm not going to make your life miserable, but equally I'm going to show you stuff that you, you're going to need from me. And I think yeah. that, that feeling of valuing the artist is getting lost in this, like, bureaucratic uh, yeah. stampede. Yeah. Could not agree more. Dominic Cavendish, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thanks.